great speaker. I truly don't have words to explain him. I believe his uh, music did more than enough to introduce himself. I'd like to introduce Naki, who uh, has truly inspired me in, the, in these past four years at Elfwest University. If there's someone that I always looked up to, it was always Naki. Because with him, nothing is impossible. So Naki, can I please have you on stage? inspirational persons of all time, Helen Keller said, take your face to the sun and the shadows will fall behind you. Dear parents, friends, and TEDx attendees, Assalamu Alaikum and a very good evening to all of you. My name is Naki Haider Rizvi and I'm a third year engineering student at Al-Faisal University. I am humbled and truly honored to be able to stand in front of such a great audience to give my first TEDx talk. This talk won't be a conventionally styled speech. Instead, I would like to use this opportunity to share with you a narrative that will, that will illustrate the intent of my talk. I would request all of you to close your eyes and imagine yourself with me in the story. The story dates back to the day of my 20th birthday when I excitedly woke up in the morning to have a look at the gifts that were lying on my bedside. I spent the day with friends and was somewhat tired by the end of it. I consequently went early to bed, but a chatter in a nearby room made my ears fully alert. One of the ladies was my mother, but who could be the other one? I jumped out of bed and walked towards the source of the sound, making sure not to disturb anyone as I went. I did not turn on the lights as I was used to finding my way in the dark. The room, the door of my mother's room was closed and I fixed my ear to overhear the conversation inside. An inquisitive friend of my mother's was asking her questions about me. She began by asking my mother about my childhood. Mumtaz, she said, which is my mother's name, can you tell me about your son Nafi's childhood? My mother began by telling her when I first came into this world. On January 21st, 1991, Nafi came into this world and my husband and I were very excited to have our first baby. However, the doctors did not seem very happy looking at him. Somewhat curious and impatient, I requested them to show my son to me. Tears filled my eyes as I realized that his eyes were protruding and seemed a bit abnormal. However, we thanked God and took him home. I did not know what to do and what was wrong with him, and the doctors weren't of any help either. As he grew older, I realized that he found it difficult to find a toy when it felt far from his hand's reach. He felt everything we gave him and never smiled when we showed him his photograph. I felt helpless and did not know what to do. Everyone I asked regarding his treatment always discouraged me and said that he would be a burden on the family. I did not believe a word of what they said and knew that Naki would be a great man one day. I stood perfectly still as I heard my mother sob as she spoke. A shiver ran down my spine as I realized the hardships my parents went through to raise me. I was just a kid. I did not know what life had and what difficulties it got with itself. But my parents had to face the reality every single day. But they tried their best to keep me happy in all situations. 18 months after my birth, my sister came into this world and I was very glad to have a companion to play with, someone so little as myself. My mother's friend continued by asking her about my education. Can you tell me how the educational journey of Nafi was? It must have been difficult, right? It was difficult, very difficult indeed, 
said my mother. No school was willing to accept a visually challenged person since the skepticism associated with the so-called disabled people was an overriding factor in the decision-making process. However, one school agreed to accept him on the tradition that I would teach higher classes there. I agreed, and Nati began his academic journey. It was difficult. Students used to playfully hit him and run away. Nor could he see the blackboard. Neither could he see the blackboard, nor could he read or write like other students. He used to feel frustrated and used to ask me why was he so different. I did not know what to tell him and just said it would be over soon. I was not prepared to put him in a blind school because I knew that he would have to face the real world at some point in his life and it would be better to make him taste that flavor at an early age. He had sufficient sight till grade two to be able to read large print and write with a thick marker. However, his eyesight slowly deteriorated and his world plunged into darkness at the age of seven. That was the hardest time of my life. I did not know what to do about Nafi. And I contacted a visually challenged scientist in India, T.V. Raman, who told me to teach, a man, to teach him mental mathematics and braille. That summer, I took him to India and made sure he had the relevant resources to help him cope. The following year, the teachers were surprised by his performance and things started to get easier. I remember how he used to type on the brailler with his tiny fingers. The surprising thing, however, was that he always had a smile on his face while doing it. I stood perfectly still as I heard my mother and flashbacks of those days came in my head. I remembered how difficult life was every day brought for the self a new challenge, but I never gave up. I remembered my first com computer class when I was only eight years old. My hands used to ache as my tiny fingers were too small for the keyboard. But I persevered and tried my best, and in grade five, was awarded a distinction in English and a credit in math from the University of New South Wales. After a minute's silence, my mother continued. The most crucial stage in Nafi's life was in ninth grade, and he was faced with the decision of choosing between science or commerce as his field of study. Whomsoever he consulted advised him to go for commerce, as the diagrams and practicals would be out of the way. However, science was his passion, and he wasn't going to let go of it so easily. He persevered and struggled hard and got an excellent O-level result in nine subjects. That year, the British Council which is the organization responsible to conduct external exams, published an article about him saying that he was the first visually challenged student to have appeared in science subjects in Pakistan. <laughs> that day, I felt like our hard work had, had not been wasted. He applied to various A-level institutes and was overjoyed when the most prestigious institute for A-levels willingly accepted him. However, the road of science that he had chosen to walk upon had more thorns awaiting him, and the prospect of physics and chemistry practicals became a new hurdle. The, the Cambridge University was not going to exempt him. Instead, they gave him an assistant to work with, and he did well in all his, his A-level results. I felt pride in my mother's voice as she finished talking. And I thank God for giving me such an amazing family. If it were not for my mother's re relentless struggle, I wouldn't have been able to stand on my feet. All the people who had helped and encouraged me came back to my mind, and I felt blessed to have them around me. My mind drifted to my family's trip to Saudi Arabia in June 2009. I remembered applying to Al Faisal University that same year in August and how cooperative and supportive the staff was on seeing me. I felt very lucky and accomplished. I felt very lucky and accomplished when the dean at the time, Dr. Mahira Lodan, broke the news that I could be admitted to the College of Engineering. My joy had no bounds, and I started my beautiful four-year journey at Al Faisal University. 
I remember tearfully saying goodbye to my parents as they left for the farm, leaving me to live on my own. I had decided to live on my own and I did not regret the decision. However, sometimes I felt lonely and depressed, but the Al-Faisal family made me a part of itself and helped me whenever I needed them. All the problems I had were willingly solved by the administration, faculty, or, or my friends. I met some very special people in this journey who inspired and strengthened me and gave me strength when I felt lonely or depressed. When I needed to learn, my teachers would guide. Their voice of wisdom made me read and write. Their patience helped me through the most difficult times. My chain of thoughts was interrupted by my mother's voice and I realized that I was still standing in front of a door. She was telling her friend about my aspirations. Nakhli has always been a very ambitious boy and aims for the stars, so even if he falls, it is somewhere above the ordinary. He is striving to do well in engineering and had his name in the honors list in his first year of college. He wants to impact the world positively and I hope he will see a change soon. He wants to abolish all borders between India and Pakistan since he feels the divide very strongly. I am from India and my husband is from Pakistan. He wants to be an ambassador of change and I hope he will see a change soon. My mother's friend somewhat curiously asked, isn't that a boring life though? I mean, he concentrates all his efforts on studying since he has to put in more effort to, uh, to accomplish the same results. Not at all, said my mother. He finds his life very fulfilling and enriching because he says that the reward of his hard work is not in the outcome, but in the effort he puts in. Besides, he is strong and always has a smile on his face. He also participates in extracurricular activities such as running, swimming, and music. He holds someone's hand while running and occasionally swims in the pool. When the world seems harsh and overbearing, music never fails to calm his nerves and soothe his soul. He plays the piano and sings along. Very romantic songs though most of the times. <laughs> I heard a slight sniff and a sob in my mother's voice and she said, I am very proud of my children and thank Allah for making them stand on their feet. Even though Naki has lost his sight, he says that he has not lost his vision. He has some... He has some amazing people who help him see from their eyes. His world is as colorful and bright as someone else's. My eyes also started to tear as I heard my mother and I started to reflect on my journey of 20 years. I prayed to Allah to help me meet all the expectations that I have from myself. I do not want to depart from this world without accomplishing that what I have been sent for. I want to impact the world positively and I hope I will be able to do that. The word impossible should be eliminated from my dictionaries. As hard, work with the right, as hard work with the right approach is never wasted. It is not the right conditions that lead to success, but rather the correct mindset. Look at the Wright brothers, for instance. They did not have any money, publicity, equipment, or certainty about the outcome of the experiment, but they had, but they had a vision in mind. They wanted to make a difference and invent a machine which could fly. Who at that time could have anticipated flying machines? But they did what they believed in and see what they did. They changed the world forever. Each one of us knows what he or she is doing. Most of us know how we are doing it, but hardly any of us knows why we are doing it. Before you start anything, ask yourself, why am I doing it? It is not practice that makes a man perfect, but relentless and correct practice that leads to perfection. When you, when you see a glass half filled with water, 
interpret and perceive it as half full rather than half empty. Both perceptions are correct, but the former is more optimistic. Do not retreat to a challenge. Fight it like a warrior. Just keep in mind that every night is followed by the rising sun. Similarly, you will find victory once you have overcome a challenge. Don't fail. Failure is not when one doesn't achieve what one intends to. Failure is only when one gives up. All of us dream big, but to dream big in times of adversity is the real strength. It might sound silly, but to deceive the mind in troubled times can reduce the intensity of the challenge to a large degree. Sometimes when I'm pressured because of exams or anything that bothers me, I close my eyes and think about the people who are in situations much worse than myself. And I feel blessed. And I feel that the intensity of the challenge has reduced significantly. Be thankful for what you have. Don't crib for what you don't have. Do you know why each of us counts his misfortunes and not his blessings? Because we can count our misfortunes, but we cannot count our blessings. When you complain about driving for one hour to college every day, think about someone who doesn't have legs. When you complain about writing for hours on end, picture someone who doesn't have hands. When you are woken up at night by irritating sounds, imagine someone who cannot hear. Be thankful for what you have and always have a smile on your face. This will not only remove your and someone else's worries, but will also keep you ready for a picture at any time. My last piece of advice is, don't be satisfied with the outcome of your efforts. The reward lies in the effort you put in. Make sure you give in your best to everything and you will find completion and fulfillment in everything that you do. Thank you very much.